Continuing from the word of Yahuwah study, John 1.14 says, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So let's dig into Yeshua's coming as the Son of God. Matthew chapter 2 verse 1 says, Now when Yeshua was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. So the first thing we see here is that the Magi were alerted to the king of the Jews being born by the stars. Now, if we go back to Genesis 1, verse 14 tells us that God created the stars to be signs and to mark seasons, days, and years. And the word seasons here is moed, which generally applies to the feast days. So we need to figure out which feast day it was that was marked by the stars. Now, in Revelation 12, we see another feast day that is being marked by the positioning of the stars. It says, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. Now, the position of the sun tells us that John is speaking about Yom Teruah. And while I don't believe that John is talking about Yeshua's birth in this context, I do believe that God is consistent and uses the same feast days to mark particular types of events. And because of that, I'm going to start with this as a reference and see how far it gets us. So in my research, I went back to around 10 BC in Stellarium, and the year that caught my eye was 3 BC, which is indicated here as negative 2 because Stellarium has a year 0, but the conventional dating doesn't. And this particular year caught my eye because of the planetary alignment. As you can see, there is a conjunction of Jupiter and Regulus, which is the brightest star in Leo. And during a conjunction, these could appear to just be one bright star. Now, Jupiter is considered to be the chief god in both Roman and Greek mythology, where it is also known as Zeus. But in Hebrew, it is called Sedek, meaning righteousness. And Regulus is Latin for king. The second thing we see is that this star went before them and stood over where Yeshua was, which seems to confirm the conjunction because the only stars that move are planets. And if we continue to move forward in Stellarium, we see that Jupiter goes into retrograde, has another conjunction with Regulus in February of 2 BC, and again in May before Venus comes along and has a conjunction with Regulus in June. Finally, John's vision says that the moon is at her feet, which narrows it down to September 9th, which according to astropixels.com was the date of the conjunction or dark moon. So given these occurrences in combination with prophecy and some other chronological factors in Yeshua's life, I believe that Yeshua, the promised seed, was born on September the 9th, 3 BC. So why choose a virgin birth, which goes against the natural order for human females as the means of introducing Yeshua to the world as the son of God? Because just as a woman's first creation, the serpent was conceived in the mind of the woman and brought forth in her will apart from any involvement of the man, then manifested in her womb as her first begotten. So God's first creation, the seed, was conceived in the mind of God and brought forth in his will apart from any involvement of the man, and then manifested in her womb as his first begotten. So that covers Yeshua's birth, and I will be going into his ministry in the spring. So now let's look at his death. In Zechariah 3, 2, it says, And Yahuwah said unto Satan, Yahuwah rebuke thee, O Satan, even Yahuwah that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. And if we go to chapter 11, verse 12 says, And I said unto them, If ye think good, give me my price, and if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver. And Yahuwah said unto me, Cast it unto the potter, a goodly price that I was prized of them. And I took the 30 pieces of silver 
and cast them to the potter in the house of Yahuwah. So at first, it seems that Zechariah is the one who is being valued at 30 pieces of silver. But in verse 13, we see that Yahuwah says it is he who is being valued at 30 pieces of silver. And then in chapter 12, verse 10 says, And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. So the Yahuwah that chose Jerusalem and was valued by them at 30 pieces of silver and subsequently pierced by them is the same one who wanted to gather them as a hen gathers her brood, but they would not. Yeshua. So what happens next? In Acts 7, before Stephen is stoned, we are told that he looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Yeshua standing on the right hand of God. And this is the beginning of the fulfillment of Psalm 110, where it says, Yahuwah said unto Adonai, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Now, even though Stephen saw Yeshua standing at the right hand of God, and the English word here is sit, the Hebrew word that is used here, Yeshab, means to sit, remain, or dwell. To continue in the fulfillment of this passage, we need to go to Yeshua's coming. So let's look again at Revelation chapter 12. In its proper context, I believe John is speaking about the birth of the children of God, which mimics Yeshua's birth. The sign again tells us the day is Yom Teruah. Yeshua referred to this day as the day which no man knew the day and hour, including himself, but the father only. There are two reasons for this. First, because there is a two to three night time span each month that the moon could go dark and be completely covered. And it is the father who determines which one of these nights it will be. The second is a reference to the Hebrew wedding. The father selects the bride and after the betrothal ceremony, the groom goes back to his father's house and prepares a chamber for him and his bride to live in. Now the bride and groom knew an approximate time frame to expect the groom to return for her. But the father is the one who tells the groom when he can go. So in saying this, Yeshua told them it would be Yom Teruah when he returned. But even so, they would not know when Yom Teruah was or which Yom Teruah it would be until the watchman blew the trumpet. But that's for Sukkot. So on that note, let's end with the first blessing of the Sheva Better Coat. The Sheva Better Coat, meaning seven blessings, were recited at Hebrew weddings. And they also would have been recited at the wedding feast in Cana in John 2, where Yeshua turned water into wine. And the first of these seven blessings is, Blessed are you, Yahuwah our God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit 